Hello and welcome to Inside Training with me, Adam Tomlinson. I'm joined today by Hibernian's new academy director, Steve Keane, who joins the club following spells with Reading, Fulham and Blackburn, alongside more recent stints managing in Singapore and Australia. In this episode, Steve outlines his plans for the academy and development squad here at Hibs and tells us how he'll work closely with Jack Ross and Ben Cancel going forward. He also gives us an insight into his career and his proven track record in developing top level talent. This chat with Steve will hopefully give you a better understanding of his work to date, his new role and what he hopes to achieve here with us. Steve, thank you for joining the latest episode of the Inside Training podcast and welcome to Hibernian Football Club as our new Academy Director. Thank you. Um, tell us about Hibs and why you chose to come here. Well, first of all, you know, a, a number of weeks ago, um, I was speaking with Jack because um, we, you know, we worked together in the coach education programme for the Scottish Football Association and that's really... You know, coaching younger coaches through their B licenses and A licenses, and myself and Jack worked quite closely in a, a few of those groups, and were paired up together. And I think initially we were chatting about the groups, and then it kind of expanded. Um, and Jack said, "Why, well, listen, there could be a bit of a restructure going on, going on at the club, and it might be something that would interest you. Would you want to come up and see the training ground and have a chat?" and it kind of just grew from there and um, that's the first stage of it and then I, I spoke with Ben, our chief exec, then that was, you know, I think, well, this is a bit different, the way that we're, we're approaching the, the kind of restructure of the academy and and then that development team that's going to bridge from the academy into Jack's first team. I thought that's, that's different and quite exciting. Then I spoke with the chairman a couple of times on the phone and I could hear his enthusiasm and his passion for for development and developing the, the young players and, and getting the academy to a really, really high level. And sometimes you just get a gut instinct that, you know, wait, wait a minute, this is this is really moving in a, a really fresh and different direction. Um, and so many people wanting young players to, to, to progress through the pathway and really make sure that the numbers are there for Jack to select and have have the the numbers but also the quality and the club have been great at uh, getting some younger players into the team over the last few years but not only a few years the history of the development of young players here at the club's something that I think is quite unique and I think that the fans love to see one of their, one of their own Yeah absolutely you mentioned there that you you, you spoke to Jack um, on a, a coaching uh, element with the SFA. Yeah, um, you didn't know him before that point. So how quick did you two kind of form that relationship? Quite quickly, to be honest. It's it's sometimes unusual, you know, when you you know you partner with different coaches and different courses, and sometimes you're there to to kind of contrast, you know, where one will deliver, you know, one aspect of a session, and some will see it quite different. I felt that when we were talking, so we would share it, I would talk first, for example, with one candidate and Jack would come in and then vice versa. And we felt together after it, when we analysed it, we were kind of on the same page and we were almost like repeating each other, you know, because we were seeing the way they were delivering sessions very similar, mm. uh, which is quite unusual because, you know, without trying, you're seeing the, the game the same way. Um so there's a bit, of, you know, a, 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 not not a bit, but a lot of synergy there. The way we see the game and how we're trying when we're delivering information, which is probably harder than than anybody thinks, to simplify the message when you're talking to players, you're talking to coaches, to really kind of wipe out all the noise and all the the kind of jargon and and just get to the kind of cutting points where the penny drops with a player or. If you're doing any in service or coach education with with a younger coach, how you can kind of cut through that and just get to the the real important part of you know what's inside a session, depending on what theme you're delivering. So we were we were on the same page really really quickly. 
you, you mentioned the the communication um, and the getting the message across to young players. That's really key, isn't it? You, you mentioned jargon and a lot of noise, but for for a young player, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen year old, they might not actually understand the jargon fully. No, and it's a it's about a kind of a, almost a layered on approach where depending on what age group they're at, you know, and it depends what you're delivering. You know, if it's technical information, you know, it's the, the detail of, it might be something as simple as their standing foot. It's not even their, their, their kicking foot. So the distance and the angle of their standing foot in relation to the ball, you know, you need to like strip it right back to something as basic as that. You know, for example, if a young player's striking the ball and it's, you know, and he, and he is a forward player and it's going over the bar, you'll probably find that he's standing foot is just a couple of centimetres too far back. And then as a result, when there's contact on the ball, the trajectory of the ball's going, you know, up and his head and shoulders are leaning back. So it's those little tiny, tiny details that, you know, you just try to layer on. Layer on and once he gets that, it's about, you know, the follow through, you know, if you're talking about technical repetition, it's it's very very detailed. So, um, I think when you you get stripped right down and you get to the the basics of coaching, and it's about controlling the ball and passing the ball and striking the ball. But there's a lot a lot of real fundamental detail that goes into that. Yeah, absolutely. And the the obviously the role of academy director is a, a brand new one here in terms of the football structure. For supporters that, that don't know what an academy director does, what, what are the main elements of the job that you'll be doing here? Well, the main elements is to oversee all the, the academy teams, you know, right from the real young ones all the way up to, obviously, the under-18s. But we are now going to stretch that. And our academy is going to stretch up to the development teams that, that are going to bridge the gap between the 18s right into, you know, Jack's first team. So that's something that's not been done before, uh, which is exciting, it's new, it's, it's different. And the plan is that that development team initially would, once it's formed, which will probably take, you know, from now till the beginning of next season, and then have a games programme that will be friendly, where we'll go down to the north of England and play, you know, what really is a, a quite an established games programme in England with their under-23 set up. Yeah. But it's a, it's a good standard, and I think it's a, you know, if, if our development team can compete and play, you know, and and do well at that level, you know, I said yesterday when 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 I was speaking to some of the guys in the press, at the moment, from our 18s to the first team, it's not a step, mm. it's a huge jump, and we need to bridge that and make sure that that's much closer. Um, so that then we can get the benefit of all the, you know, the real fundamental basic coaching and the younger age groups that get up into the 16s, up into the 18s. And then we, we bridge the gap and start to think about, you know, how's the first team playing? You know, what, what do the players in that development team need to do to be involved with the first team? You know, and the kind of a reverse side of it is sometimes in a development position, you're looking players leaving the club and we're, we have to have a depth chart to be able to replace them mm. and when you replace you always have to have you know better quality than the, the ones that's left so that the the level of the the club goes up so that's that's the that's the challenge and that's the that's the job that that's it really isn't it you, you mentioned bridging the gap yeah There's, the 18s are doing really well this yeah. season the fans have noticed and a lot of hype can be created around young players and, and getting them in. But like you say, that, that jump is massive and playing teams down south where there is that structure in terms of the league then allows you to actually assess how good those players actually are rather than almost setting them up to fail by bringing them in too early. Yeah, I think, I mean, like I said, if the gap's too big, you know, we've got nowhere else to play them mm. apart from going out on loan, you know, and then... They're obviously away from our environment. They're in, you know, you would probably say they're in real football, men's football, and away from youth football. But that's not necessarily the step they have to take. If we can, you know, bridge the gap and have them still training with us, have a, a real competitive games program, 
and then they go and, and start to train with the first team. I, I would, I would, you know, say that they're going to be way closer than they are taking that huge, huge leap at the moment. And you know, we'd like to think that we can keep them in the building and we would have everything here as opposed to. Sometimes players need need a loan and they need mm. to go out in a competitive football, but it's it's very individual. Sometimes players are better staying and and working with their own club, providing that we have um, that that team where it can really challenge them. Because almost a game, you know, it doesn't matter what day it is, but a game is really how you've progressed through the week. Yeah. You know, each week you've learned what you've learned. If it's tactical, physical. Uh, technical, even mental, they go through different uh, mental stages in their, their maturation, young players what have they learned that week that then they can go and deliver then we measure that, we strip it down, we let them analyse it themselves, we look at it, staff look at it ok, next week here, here's here's your, here's your the, the goals for next week and we periodise all the different aspects of the game how have we done this week and it's just week by week and we're, we're only trying, trying to get them closer to the first team yeah, absolutely, and you, you can tell by just the way you're speaking that you've got a real passion for for young players and, and developing them. Obviously, you're back in Scotland now for the first time in, in over 30 years as well. Where did that passion for developing young players first come from for you? It was actually before I stopped playing. I was fortunate enough at a young age when, when I left Celtic as a, a very young player. I went abroad and um, I went to Portugal and, and played there and it was something really different, it was, you know, much more tactical, mm. uh, slower, which suited me. Uh, I wasn't the quickest. <laughs> um, but I seen a different side to coaching. We had double sessions. This this was in a first-team environment mm. because we had a nice climate, but we had technical training, different physical training. Um, and I just thought, I'd never seen any anything like that before. That was, you know, it was a long time ago. But you know that kind of technical work, not not really games in every single session. You know, I think sometimes in our DNA, you know, we want to, we want to have a game, right? You know, forget the warm up. Can we play a game? Yeah. Was you know, I think certainly in Portugal when I was playing there, and then in Spain when I was working there, the. The, the younger players and even up into the young pros and then into the the first team they, they don't get bored I think with repetition or technical work yeah. I think sometimes we get a bit bored with it and we want to well, let's just you know play the game and I think if we, if we can get away from that and I, that's not a bad thing to have the, the competitive edge inside you but we, we'll always have that it's in, the, it's in our DNA but I think if we can have the, the technical element then when we play a game, it's it's a tactical game, it's a physical game, it's also a technical game. Mm. I think if we can get that in, and that's what I seen to answer your question. That's what I seen when I was a young player, and then you know when I when I finished playing and I started coaching at Reading in, in the mid nineties. You know we were in a it was a pre academy because the, there wasn't an academy status then in England. It was mm. centre of excellence. But then we we managed to get academy status when that first started, and um, with a great academy at Reading, and and really tried to get as many young players into the team as we, we could. And then in two thousand, I went to Fulham, and from there, you know, it really opened up my mind because I was open, really up to the the uh, Claire Fontaine. We had a, fr- a, um, a French staff, and I was able to go to Clenf- Clairefontaine in Paris and study what they did in their um, national schools and all the players that they produced was was incredible. What, what did they do differently then? Uh, they had, their contact time was huge at a young age. They had, they had, they had I think, 18, 20, 18 and 20 hours with real young, young age groups, mm-hmm. you know, each week. And, you know, they had... Basically, uh, it was almost like a school's curriculum for football. So it wasn't, you know, they were just sessions. It was experts at each age group and they would have a curriculum where they would have, you know, work on this and only this before before passing on to the next age group and really drill down into the detail of 
those different types of technique um, and it, you know the standard was phenomenal and the the, the players that the French national team were, were producing then uh, uh, you know under 16s under 18s under 21s was incredible and you know they all came through that Clairefontaine system and I'm guessing after you kind of learnt about that you, you tried to bring as much as that back into into your role yeah I think Everything you've, you know, every club you go to, every country you go to, you, you take a little bit, you know, and, and I think that then moulds the way you, you, you deliver sessions and your outlook on on coaching. Um, so I think it's it's a bit of a kind of hybrid of everything that you see and you're always learning. The game's always evolving and developing. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a little bit of everything. And you, your time at uh, Real Sociedad was really eye-opening for you as well wasn't it yes not only so said that but in that region mm. in the Basque region you know you've got a physical Bilbao and you've got so said that that I've got a phenomenal record of producing players from their academy and yeah. playing them in the first team and they see it as you know you play them and if the big clubs if, if Barca and Real Madrid and Valencia and Seville's come calling they'd normally sell that you know mm. it's a a real self sustaining model the next one, yeah. and there's, a, there's another one ready and they go in so there's the amount of players that have come through that and you know the Sansei which is the second team uh, the, the players that they were producing was incredible but the, what I've seen there was a real detail in their recruitment the way they recruited in their area was amazing and the amount of numbers of scouts and um, every single school every single region all over uh, the Basque region is covered by wow. you know you go to any type of Sunday game Saturday morning game with the youngest kids we had scouts there you know trying to trying to get the best kids away from Bilbao and then so said that wow that's amazing yeah the amount of manpower that must huge, have taken huge and the partnerships you know with schools and the partnerships with local uh, boys boys clubs and girls clubs that were playing football was really really strong um because it's quite remote some parts of the Basque country so massive community program where we're trying to involve you know a little bit further out where we would go as a first team once a month we would train in a, a bit of a kind of remote area uh, and then kids would come from the local schools we'd give them tickets they would they would come to the game and then we would make connections with you know those regions and those those local uh, clubs so th the real kind of way that they intertwined the the club and stretched it to every every part of the region was an amazing amazing yeah. really really interesting and very different really yeah. to how we do it here yeah um we is... almost wait, we almost wait to the the fans and the, the players come to us mm. they they go they do it a different they go out and go we're here with they put on things during half term they put on things at the weekends to engage and just encourage them to come out and it's it's not technical coaching it's just come out and play yeah and then they identify from just seeing players all age groups all shapes all sizes uh, boys girls they see them out there more in a kind of community aspect for for fun and then they identify who they are and get to know you know speak to the parents you know invite everybody to the game but that, that 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 player can play that player can play and just you know m make connections and the way they do it is phenomenal yeah really really interesting I can imagine especially going from kind of country to country yeah um, and then obviously you had a key role in developing players you mentioned Reading already and Fulham and Blackburn as well Grant Hanley Phil Jones for example yeah we'd, we'd a lot of players came through we had, we had uh, those two Phil came in Grant came in more or less at the same time but then we had Jason Lowe who came in from the academy went on to captain yeah. the club Junior Hoylett came into the team then he was sold uh, Marcus Olsen Martin Olsen twin brothers that, 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 that came through the academy there was there was many players that came in um, because at that stage there was a lot of first team players that were being sold that gave them the opportunity the young players to come in and a lot of them went on to have you know really strong careers at the club, and then subsequently were sold on and have had good careers at other clubs. So that's 
that's just the the, the, the way the cycle goes sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even like your time at Coventry as well, you were with the likes of Jordan Henderson, for example, who's very, yeah. very young at that point. Yeah, we took we took Jordan and we had Kasper Schmeichel. Yeah. We had um, Scott Dan, I signed Scott later on. Uh, Danny Fox, who went on to represent Scotland. Um, with lots of very, very good young players that had sometimes been, you know, overlooked at bigger clubs. You know, Scotty Dan and Danny Fox, you know, great players in the, the Merseyside area of the, mm. the country and probably were looking to be picked up with Liverpool or Everton, but, but didn't and went to smaller club. And then we picked him up from there. Casper was let go by Man City and we, we took him. Uh, we took a young Aaron Gunnarsson, who was, who was from Iceland but was playing out in Holland. We brought him in at a very young age and... He went on to captain his country. So you have Casper captain his country. Yeah. Aaron. Um, then, you know, the, the, the amount of young players that we had were, was, was really, really good. People won't be able to see this, but it, it's fantastic to see just how much joy it brings on, like the smile on your face when you're talking about these guys that you helped develop and have such fantastic yeah. careers as well. You, you then obviously went um, into kind of first team elements, yeah. assistant manager and eventually manager when you are in those positions obviously in the back of your mind things do change because you have to focus on results rather than bringing players through but I can imagine just listening to your passion your smile on your face that Mm. there is that element still within you that you wanted to give those young players an opportunity yeah I think you can develop players at different ages and stages Mm. you know I think you know even if somebody's a senior pro I think if you analyse their game, the, you know, without patronising them, there, there might be something that you can help them with. Certainly then with the young players that are learning their trade, I think you can help them even more. But I, I think you can improve players. I think you can help players no matter what age they are. Um, but whatever, whenever I was a, an assistant, I'd been a youth coach before. Whenever it had been, you know, when I was a, you know, a, a head coach, I'd been an assistant before. So... Mm. Once you've done the kind of different jobs inside the the coaching element of a club, you understand that you're probably a little bit closer to the younger age groups, and you then as you move up, you know, the senior side, you're you're maybe a little bit closer with the players rather than the manager if you're the first team coach or the assistant, because the managers may be speaking with the board, you know, or, or or speaking with the directors and doing the press and all that commitment. So I was more, you know. When I when I was doing the assistant manager's role for you know a long long time, uh, I was probably more close with the players and uh, assembling sessions, delivering sessions, uh, because the manager was was busy with other commitments. It's that you know you, you you take a load because they're always pulled up to doing you know different commitments. So I was always more hands on with the players and more pitch based, uh, which I think probably suits my, my skill set yeah I was going to say like having all that experience in different roles in different countries really helps you um, in in this role at Hibs really doesn't it because you have the understanding of, of what Jack wants you've been in his shoes pretty much well obviously at, at Blackburn and, and so on um, it, it helps you then know exactly what he wants from, from you and a person in your role but then how you can help the coaches below you and help the young lads progress yeah, you, I mean, it's, there's there's lots of different facets to it because you know we've got we've got some very good senior players, mm. and we've got uh, David Gray, for example, who's who's finished playing now and he's he's in his first coaching role with the club, so we've got you know young coaches that have been experienced players, so I think those type of you know people we would love to keep inside the club. You yeah. know, Jack's Jack's brought Dave and on, on, onto the staff and. In years to come, there's probably going to be senior players that we would like to to help in their transition from playing into coaching. And, you know, I, I certainly think we can help them with that because it's a, a really tough transition mentally um, when they're, they're, they feel themselves getting to the end of their career, but mm. they want to start their coaching career and you want to have it as smooth as you can. So I think we can, we can certainly have, you know, lots of... 
coach development taking place with, with, with that group and then obviously there's the, the coaches that we already have in, inside the academy and inside yeah. the club where we want to be having in-service training so we're making sure that we're all on the same page we're making sure that we're seeing the game uh, you know as close to each other, as each other as we can because you don't want you know one coach at one age group delivering you know a certain uh, style of play and then another coach to a different style of play. They need to learn systems, uh, which is important in their development, but the style and how what we're trying to put across the whole academy should remain the same, um, which is, you know, a, a really a, a coaching programme that will be written, well, it is written, but it will be delivered mm. to make sure we've got a style of play, but we'll, we'll learn every system and we'll learn all the different elements that, that, that when they got up the age groups, uh, depending on what system Jack wants to play, they'll know them all, and I think that's that's really what we're, we're, we'll, we'll do from from day one. Yeah, and obviously, um, we want to touch a little bit on your kind of management uh, career mm-hmm. as well. Um, at, at Blackburn, obviously, like you say, you were assistant first, and then and then came into the management role. Um, how much, when you when you kind of look back at that period, how much do you think you kind of developed in terms of um, a, a coach and, and taking on like different responsibilities. Yeah, it's interesting because, like I said, I was always pitch based, mm. and then you you know you end up having to do, you know, you're in the Premier League. You, the, the press commitments are, are massive, and our our owners were based in India, so I would, I'd go to India every month to basically have the board meeting there. Wow. Okay. Um, so, as far as getting there and having the meeting and getting back and make sure I wouldn't miss any training was was a big commitment and then you know the regular press contact yeah. probably pulled me away from where I was more comfortable because I always felt that you know my my biggest asset was working with the players and being on the pitch and uh, that 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 was tough because that's not something you can delegate mm. you know I can't delegate somebody to go and do the press or go and meet the owners. I had to go and do that. But yeah. I also wanted to... Be hands-on, yeah. You know, be... You know, Play to your strengths. Yes, exactly. So, you you know, uh, that, that was uh, it was tough because you, you're, trying to, you're trying to keep all the plates spinning. Mm. Um, but in all my time there, the players were superb. They, they, they were really, really good. And there was a massive transition on players that were sold just because... We had to raise funds and we had to bring the wage bill down. But like I said earlier, that gave opportunity to a lot of young ones to come in and they were great. And, you know, a lot of them have went on to be, you know, very, very good players. Yeah, and then you obviously continued in, in management and went abroad to, yeah. to Singapore. Um, how big of a decision was that at the time to, to go to Singapore? Obviously, completely new country again, but equally... I guess for yourself, uh, a chance to grow your kind of football knowledge. Yeah, well, it was a, it was a kind of blank sheet of paper when mm. I, uh, we played in the Singapore League, but we were actually based in Brunei. Right. So I was working for a club in Brunei that was owned by uh, the royal family. The Crown Prince was the the owner. The, the Sultan of Brunei's son owned the team, and they didn't have they had one they had one team. They didn't have a reserve team. They didn't have an academy. They hadn't won anything, and I thought, okay, I'll go for a year and see if we can win something and see if we can build a second team, start the academy. Mm-hmm. And then I ended up staying for four years where we, we won you know, lots and lots of games. We won the FA Cup, won the league, started the academy, started the, the reserve team. A lot of the older players then are put in positions to start coaching the, the, the younger age groups. So it was... It was really satisfying when I was working with the first team, but I was also almost going to yeah. run the academy as well. So I was I was doing everything, uh, but I was coaching the local. I, I went on my own. I was coaching the local coaches, so it was it was just something that I poured myself into, and it was fabulous. I had a fabulous four years. It, it seems like it was the the challenge that enticed you almost a little bit to like a this little bit role. Like here. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. a little bit like here, where you know because of COVID, we've had to shut down. Mm. We've had to strip everything back to the bare bones, and now we have to build it back up again, and then you know take take it take it above and beyond where it's been. So that's that's exciting because it's we're going to have a, a new team that sits under underneath the first team that 
that's brand new. We're going to, you know, change a lot of things in the academy, hopefully for the better, and make sure that we've got, you know, we're all the, the scouts and, you know, the, the the coaches all see the game the, the same way. I feel in, not not only in youth development, but I think even in first team, it's because there's so much analysis that recruitment and coaching are, are kind of getting pushed apart a little bit. Mm. And I'd like to think that inside the academy we can, you know, bring all that closer together because there, there is a place for the, the amount of data that's out there now and statistics to involve that in the recruitment process, but also make sure that eyes on, you know, old fashioned scouting, if you like, yeah. where you, you know, you would say your eyes, your judge, but now we can back up that by data if we can get our hands on it and especially if we can get the players into the the academy and we can do testing and we can do um, you know we've got different types of technology we that can uh, determine how how fast they're running how how many metres they've covered their high intensity work you know the, their technical repetition how many touches they can make in you know three minutes that gives you an indication of what level of technical ability they have so there's un- so much tech, but we can hopefully mirror that together with the, you know, the the, the people who know mm. uh, inside the academy that, you know, what what a good young player looks like, and we we have a lot of good people in the building. And, and I guess from your kind of background, obviously, uh, last job was was in Australia. Yeah. Um, having the experiences that you had in different countries, learning different cultures. Um, about different styles of play in different countries and the talent pool that that is available for you then to to kind of come into this role your pool and wealth of football knowledge is almost invaluable yeah we throughout the years you make contacts and then like a, you've you've touched on there you go to different countries and you see the games played in different ways you know in Australia where I was last year mm. It's it's an unbelievably physical league, and I don't mean tackles and headers, um, because they play Aussie rules and because they play rugby union at a very very high level. Um, probably football's the third sport, I yeah. would say, and if they've not made it in Aussie rules or, or they're, they're not going to have a professional career in rugby, they'll probably look at football. But the amount of uh, kilometres at the cover. It's very, very common to see a midfield player doing 15 kilometres, which is really, really high end in, in the UK. But it's it's really common in Australia. Uh, I, I thought it... I didn't realise that I had Brett Emerton when I was in at Blackburn. Mm. And Emo could run for fun and he was a machine. I thought, that's really unusual until I went to Australia. And then <laughs> many, many players can cover that <laughs> amount of ground. But maybe on the technical side, you know, a bit... Not as not as refined mm. um, as in in England because I, I, I worked predominantly in England, so the ball would ch- the ball would change hands a lot. So it was really a transitional league. Yeah. So it was physical. You know who 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 was running the most, who was best on transition, and and lots of times where it's going to change hands, who's going to pick it up? It's going to go for the next attack. Then it's going to change hands again. Who's going to pick it up? So I learnt a lot of. A lot of things that kind of changed my way of thinking, which was your organisation behind the ball, even when you were attacking. Mm. So something that, you know, kind of a term now, rest defence. So when you're attacking, you're you're almost thinking, you know, subconsciously, you're going to lose it. Yeah, where, where are we? Where are we? You know, to, to counter press and, and get that rest defence right so that we can be the team, even if we do lose, lose it, we're picking it up again. And then we're going to we're going to form another attack. Almost so that like was basketball in that. Yeah, that. it was. If, if you watch the A League, mm. it really is. It, it goes box to box, and now with the rules as well, where each team's allowed to make five substitutions. Yeah. So at the end of the game, normally it's really common. So you've got ten new players on the pitch. In Australia, it doesn't matter if a team's win two 0 they're not managing the game. They're trying to try to get it to right. three or four, so it's still open. Uh, if the team's losing two 0 they don't think well. It's damage limitation. We're going to sit back and protect a goal difference and make sure it's not. They just go for it, and it's even more open. So you get 
incredibly open games with you know lots of goals, lots of chances. Uh, probably good to watch for the neutral, maybe not so good for the staff <laughs> that's sitting on the side. But uh, yeah, a really interesting league. Yeah, I, I think I could pick your brains about uh, where you've worked for for hours, but I'll bring it back um, to to Hibs. And um, we obviously spoke at, at the start of this podcast about your relationship with Jack, um, with the new structure. Just how closely will yourself, Ben, and Jack work together on um, the football side of things, recruitment, coaching, etc.? Well, with, when I come up in in that period to to see the training ground and, and speak with Ben. You know, Ben's came from Norwich, mm-hmm. which has got a great, um, and rightly so, it's got a great reputation as a football club being sustainable. Yeah. So I think probably more from the chairman and, and from Ben, they want to make the club sustainable, um, which obviously takes revenue and, you know, you get revenue from different places, but you also get it from you know, player sales, that, that's that's a part of every club. So, you know, we've got, you know, very, very good players in the moment, and uh, at the moment, sorry, in the first team. And then my job underneath is to make sure that that pool's there ready if, if they're sold and when they're sold. Uh, that, that there's other players to come in that, that first of all, can go and get results for us mm. uh, and take us... Higher, even higher than Jack's already uh, taken the first team over the last few years, which had been amazing. So, you know, I really need to get this development team up and running quick because um, we we need quality to to go in um, if players do leave leave the club. And you know, each time that somebody leaves, you want somebody from within that's even better. Yeah. But um, you know, you will, you know that Jack's. We'll probably have to go into the market and and, and invest again, but um, that's what we I think we'll, we're trying to do. We're trying to replenish, develop, mm. and then when we sell uh, again, you know, replenish, develop, and, and the, that that model that that keeps going to make the club sustainable. And that starts at the the younger age groups, making sure that there's a depth chart and there's people ready to go into those roles and and make the, the first team. Um, even better um, if that's possible Absolutely and then I can imagine when you're setting up this development team um, and bridging that gap once or whilst there's the 18s are still in their age group before they've moved up um, people will be kind of thinking well do we have enough players for a development team um, how would that look how would that feel obviously there are the guys like um, Josh Campbell Jamie Gullen Dan Mackay to a certain extent as well that would benefit from playing regular games yeah, um, and the 18s that, that would kind of step up. But in terms of recruitment as well, is that something that we'd, we'd look at doing? Definitely. I think, I think we'll, we'll be recruit, recruiting players from, you know, different areas the, of the country, uh, maybe other, other countries as well that, you know, where we, we, we feel as though there's players and markets that we can bring players in. Um, but certainly, if if if, if an eighteen, a, a seventeen, uh, under seventeen player who's playing in under eighteens uh, is ready t- to be stretched and can play up, mm. you always want to play them up if if they can, if it's good for them and they can stretch themselves. And then if there's players that younger players that are in the squad that have not got minutes and they need minutes and it needs to be in a competitive nature and we're we're playing against um, some really really good opposition. Um, in England, I think that that will benefit that they're going to have very very good games. That then when they go back and uh, they they have to play again for the first team that they're ready. Mm. Um, I think there's nothing to substitute, you know, a, a real good games program because yeah. the players um, they like to train but they love to play, yeah. um, and and we need to make sure that you know those games are good enough and the standards are good enough that they continue to develop. And they can continue to test themselves um, so that when they, they do play they, they, they're ready to produce Supporters will be able to see that as well I mean even this year um, there was a game against Man United's under 23s right at the start of the season um, and more recently uh, there was a game against Huddersfield Town's B team uh, where Jamie Gullen scored a hat-trick and, and that led to alongside his positive training performances his way back into the first team squad and starting games again so you can see there there's, there's like a real snippet of 
the model, but when that regular program is is in place, how it would actually bear fruit for Jack Ross's side. Yeah, because you you always want to be playing against the best possible opposition when you're in a development phase. Mm. You know, it's not about points; it's about stretching yourself against other opposition where they can. You know, if you're thinking about defensively, where they're going to open you up, and you can actually see that how you need to defend one one on one. You know how 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 you as a defender can cope with you know quick movement, intelligent movement, and if you've been asked questions, then you know if if you're a midfield player and you're a creative midfield player, or if you're a wide player and you're playing against a good defence, a real good defence, how can you open them up? Yeah. You know, you, you want that challenge so that then when you do go into the first team or get the opportunity to play uh, for Jack's team in, um, in a big game, because every game's big, uh, in, in the Premier League, we, uh, we're ready. You know, if, 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 it's a, if it's a friendly match, uh, you, know, you know, it's and it's not really... A, you know, you're not stretching yourself. I think that becomes difficult to replicate. Um, you know that real standard where we're, we're challenging each player. Yeah, and obviously for that team, we're looking different markets, like like you mentioned, um, down south, abroad, using yeah. some of your contacts too. Um, but also in Scotland, you, you can see in the national team at the moment, there's loads of young players that are starting to to come through, and there's a lot of talent here, isn't there? There is a lot of talent here. You know, and um, you know, you you see it. I don't know if you've seen last night when they done the twenty ones playing against Belgium. You see that the level that they're at, you know, and that can only benefit. I know that Scotland didn't win, but to go and play against countries of that level, where you're continually stretching yourself, um, and then now we're seeing in, in, in the, the national team, the the main team, lots of Scottish players now playing at big clubs in England, yep. which is a bit of a throwback to what it was when. We were regularly qualifying for tournaments and doing well, so I don't think there's there's any um, you know any area of doubt that there's a correlation when you know domestic players for, for the national team play down south when they have to raise their levels. Um, you know the, the the national team are getting that benefit. Um, so what we've got to do as a club is almost take take that and think well how can we in, in the development team go and play against better opposition that stretches our uh, requirements to deliver and then we get the benefits that, that, that they come back and they're going to the first team ready and you know really adapted to play against you know players where they can go and you know do themselves justice really yeah absolutely and I'll just um, leave you with with one final question Um what are your main aims? What do you want to really achieve here? Well, we want to f- have an academy that, that that the supporters and the the owners are proud of. We want to have an academy that that's a real academy, which I believe is um, a department that produces players that become become professional players. Hopefully for us, uh, and if they can't play for us, then we have a revenue stream before they get to the first team. If they do get to the, the first team, then they're, they're of such a good quality that they become players that we hopefully keep for a long, long time. And if we do get offers from them that we can't refuse, then the, 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 they're sold for a, a good price. It's reinvested and that cycle uh, goes again. And we we get the benefit of seeing lots of young players come through and, and, and do well for the club for many years to come. Absolutely, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really, really fascinating. Um, And it really does sound like there's an exciting future for our academy. Thank you very much. So there we go. A truly fascinating chat with Steve about his background in coaching and his plans for our academy. Hopefully we gave you an insight into his experience, his incredible pool of knowledge and how he perfectly fits this brand new role here at Hibernian. As always, thank you very much for listening and make sure you check out some of our other podcasts like Inside Training with Jack Ross or The High Bee Buzz.